All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining Rayma today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Evelyn Lake. Oh, sorry. Dr. Lake is an assistant professor in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging at Yale. She completed her PhD in the Department of Medical Biophysics at the University of Toronto, where she focused on the application of multimodal imaging methods in a rodent model of focal ischemic stroke. Her work focuses on applying connectome predictive modeling to understand the transdiagnostic phenotypes of autism and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, as well as developing simultaneous multimodal bold fMRI and wide field calcium imaging technology. Today, she is going to talk about multi-scale imaging of neurogliovascular activity, simultaneous cortex-wide, cell type specific fluorescence calcium imaging and whole brain uh, fMRI. Before I hand the mic over to Evelyn, I just want to remind you to please address your questions using the Q&A box. And all right, over to you, Evelyn. Okay, let's see if this works. All right, can everyone see my, uh, can someone see my slides or at least let me know if they can? Not yet. Oh, all right, let's try that one more time. Second time's a charm? Perfect. Yes, awesome. thank you. Okay, and you'll let me know if it's the presenter view instead of the, uh, the actual slides? That's good, that's good. Awesome, okay. So hi everyone. First of all, I wanna say just a big thank you to Bruce for the invitation, as well as to Ora and Kira for helping with all the organizational aspects. Um, so today I plan to introduce you to a new tool um, we've designed and built, um, which enables simultaneous mesoscale or cortex-wide fluorescence imaging of the, and uh, simultaneous whole brain uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. So I'll go over the details of how the device works, some of our preliminary findings with our first pilot data set, um, and then some of the tools for analyzing these data, which we've been working on developing. And at the end, I'll introduce you to some of the ways uh, we're planning to push this approach um, forward. So I'd like to encourage everyone to please chime in um, with any questions um, or comments or different points of view as the presentation goes along. Uh, I'm terrible at following the chat, so please alert me in, in a way that's, that's not in the chat or raising a hand, just uh, start speaking is totally fine with me. Um, yeah, so with that, let's uh, get started. Okay, so brain function and evidence of organization is found across both spatial and temporal scales. Um, at the level of a single neuron or a synapse belonging to that neuron, we can observe with up to like exquisite detail using some modalities evidence of different systems at work. Now these neurons, um, as well as their own little sophisticated unit um, of activity and function and organization exist within a milieu or a soup of other cell types, including other neurons, glia, astrocytes, pericytes, blood vessels. I'm sure I'm forgetting someone's favorite um, in that list, but you get the idea. Um, together, they give rise to something that's another level of functional organization or another functional unit, which we can observe um, to behave with some level of predictability. So this view provides a window into the brain, in this case, a mouse brain, a somewhat small window. Um, but the brain itself also shows another level of organization through circuits, network level function, uh, which scales um, to include the whole organ itself. And further, this organ exists not in isolation, but within um, an animal, an animal that also has multiple levels of organization, different systems. I'm just gonna adjust my scale here because I'm gonna run out of slide room, <laughs> basically. Um, so housed within this animal, bunch of complex different systems that also contain multiple levels of organization and interdependent systems that together somehow give rise to a complex set of behaviors or a whole organism. Now we also have another axis that I can add here. We have different species. And across here, we have commonality in different organ, organ systems, but also differences. And then finally, a whole population level, which 
to some degree is what we're really interested in studying. So across these different scales, spatial, temporal, species, we have different ways of interrogating or putting a little spotlight on different levels of organization. We can use, say, um, electrophysiology to look at spiking activity, or we can use two photon fluorescence microscopy to look at um, the neuroglovascular unit within the cortex of a mouse. We can use mesoscale calcium imaging or fluorescence imaging to look at the whole cortex in a mouse. Um, or in a rat or another model organism. We can also use techniques like fMRI or structural MRI um, to look at the whole brain and then so on and so forth. However, connecting between these different um, views that we have into brain function or brain organization can be fairly challenging. And as you try to go further and further, um, across larger sets of spatial temporal space or even between species, it gets more and more challenging to, to introduce inferences. So one way in which we can get around or bridge the gaps between these different modalities is to start to develop simultaneous multimodal imaging strategies. So this gives us a way to bridge some of what we see with one contrast or one tool that's specialized um, in one milieu and connect it to what is a specialization for a different tool or modality. Um, however, this can be technically challenging to do because physically putting the equipment together can be very hard um, and also compromising between different experimental approaches or necessary experimental features can be challenging. Um, however, this is an active area um, of research, absolutely, which many people in this center have made a lot of strides into, um, and something that I'm going to focus on um, in the next uh, half an hour or so. Okay, so micro focuses on the combination of two modalities, fluorescence imaging and magnetic resonance imaging. The fluorescence imaging, uh, we for, for, for fluorescence imaging, pardon me, uh, we introduce a genetically encoded or virally mediated fluorescence indicator, such as GCAMP, which I'm just showing a cartoon of here, um, into the mouse brain. So these indicators can be targeted to specific cell types and provide means of measuring cell type specific activity from large areas of the brain. So a movie of this activity uh, shown here um, gives you an idea of what these data look like. So, the uh, increased uh, or red signal here shows blooms of calcium activity, whereas the decreases or cool colors show decreases in activity. So these data are acquired through an optically exposed um, but still intact skull and are typically acquired using a setup that follows the schematic that's outlined here. So you place the mouse underneath an objective, you have a dichroic mirror which relays your excitation light onto the mouse through the objective and then your signal or the fluorescence um, passes through the dichroic and is passed to a camera where you can collect it as a movie. So our goal was to come up with a design which would enable us to collect these data within an MRI scanner. To accomplish this, we needed to deal with the confined space. So we have a bore that's about nine centimeters in diameter. And we also had to deal with the high magnetic field, which precludes using any ma metal components inside the scanner. Um, in a typical setup where this camera um, and objective are used outside of the scanner, there's a lot of metal. It also occupies a lot of space. So on the one hand, um, we have Mesoscale fluorescence imaging, um, which offers us a cell type specific measurement of spontaneous activity from across the cortex. And on the other hand, we have MRI, which offers us this whole brain measurement of activity through functional magnetic resonance imaging. So the fMRI signal is a cell type agnostic or relatively low spatial temporal resolution fluorescence signal compared to the fluorescence signal. However, um, it gives us great coverage, including the whole brain in a mouse. And it gives us a stepping stone um, in terms of contrast between the mouse and a signal that can be collected um, in patients or in healthy people. So that was part of our motivation of trying to put these technologies together. So to accomplish our goal of combining these two uh, modalities, we came up with the following scheme. 
So in the room that's neighboring the magnet, um, we house the camera, computer, light source, um, everything that's MRI incompatible. And we use a really long fiber optic bundle as well as liquid light guide to, to relay our signal as well as our, our excitation light into the uh, scan room. It's about uh, 15 feet long, I think. So a photograph of the business end of the device, which uh, actually gets inserted into the magnet is shown here uh, with some of the key components indicated. So we have our head plate, we have a prism, telecentric lens, fiber optic bundle and the liquid light guide and the mouse would be under here where the cyan light is, is turned on just to orient you to that end. And uh, we can open this up um, with a bit of a cartoon so I can show you the light path. So the excitation light enters via the liquid light guide at the bottom. It's redirected by 90 degrees off of a mirror. Um, and then it, with again within the telecentric lens reflected off the prism, which is right above the mouse's head and then shone onto the mouse's head. And similarly, the G-CAMP signal in this case, um, shown in cartoon in green, it bounces off of the prism, passes through the dichroic mirror, and then we can collect it using our fiber optic bundle. So the real key component um, in terms of the equipment here is this fiber optic uh, bundle, which contains about 2 million fibers, giving us a field of view that's about 1.4 centimeters squared. Um, the other uh, important features of this setup are the surgery, um, which we've developed to be compatible with longitudinal imaging. So it's a glass plate that gets affixed to the uh, mouse's skull using a combination of glue and dental cement. And it has two dovetails that are 3D printed that are affixed to the side so that it can dovetail um, with the holder that fits snugly underneath our RF coil. And we use an RF coil that's uh, built in house but it's basically a saddle shape, so sort of a bent rectangle, which gives us really nice coverage of the brain, in particular, uh, the deeper uh, structures, as well as um, not blocking our light path. So now we have two types of data. We have our calcium imaging data from the whole cortex, as well as our fMRI data from the whole brain. And the next challenge in these experiments was coming up with a multimodal registration approach. So these data are synchronously acquired, um, yet it's not a straightforward problem to move them into the same physical space. Um, so this is the scheme that we came up with in order to do this. On the one hand, the mesoscale fluorescence imaging, which is two-dimensional. On the other hand, we've got the fMRI data, um, which is acquired in 3D. And I'm including some example movies of typical EPI data, both acquired in the axial coronal directions or page through axial and coronally here. Um, with the resolutions in TR mentioned. Now these data are, are acquired at the same time. So hopefully this alleviates some of the concerns about susceptibility artifacts caused by the head implant or by the uh, optical equipment that's housed inside the scanner. So from the calcium data, um, which is I've been showing you movies up until now, we can take a single frame um, and that's what this looks like here. So this is um, averaged over a few seconds of time um, to sort of backlight the uh, nice vessels that we can see on the surface of the brain. So this is a, a combination of what you're seeing here is the cortical vessels that are on top of the cortex, as well as dura and skull vessels, since this preparation had no skull thinning, um, just to give you a sense of what we're actually seeing through the uh, device. So with the MRI uh, system, we can also collect a 3D angiogram. So this is a sequence which highlights the uh, blood vessels within the tissue in 3D. What's shown here is a maximum intensity projection of this 3D acquisition. Um, so we've come up with a way to make these data look a little bit more like the calcium data or the, the optical data um, by using a ray casting algorithm that sort of shades um, the data as it goes towards the sides of the brain and also limits the signal to what is on the surface to create basically what the angiogram would look like or the mouse brain would look like um, in 3D from above. So this, this image nicely highlights the blood vessels that run across the cortical surface um, in, the MRI, in the MRI data. And what you note here is that within both of them, you can see these nice middle cerebral artery projections. So they're a little faint but in the uh, optical image, but they're definitely, definitely there. And we use these as hard landmarks 
to move the calcium data into the MRI space. So you can see that data just overlaid in green um, on the far right. So in order to do this, um, we developed a bunch of uh, specialized tools um, that are housed within the Bioimage Suite software. This is a software that's developed by Dr. Papadimitris in the, in the lab. And uh, they're all freely available online. So the visualizations that I'm using in this presentation, as well as um, a lot of the analyses are all within that toolkit and can be used by anyone. So I encourage you to check it out. It's a really helpful tool for uh, these analyses. So with, these key, with this key transformation in hand, um, we still, uh, we're a step closer to having our functional data in the same space, but we still have a little ways to go. So I'm gonna highlight that because we really wanna get this fMRI data and calcium data into the same space. Okay, so with this uh, angiogram, as well as the fluorescence imaging data, um, we also acquire a high resolution isotropic anatomical image of the whole brain. So for that, we use a multi-spin multi-echo sequence. And I'm just showing a 3D rendering of that data here along with the single slice um, for, uh, for reference. The fMRI data, which covers most of the whole brain, I'm showing a similar 3D rendering here, um, gets registered to this anatomical data uh, in two steps. First to a high in-plane resolution anatomical image, which matches the same prescription as the fMRI data, although I'm not showing that image here. And then to this isotropic whole brain image. Um, an example of the EPI, this one collected at a slightly lower resolution than the one on the last slide um, is shown here. So using a nonlinear registration, we can all, we have also created an average anatomical reference space. So this uses data from uh, 160 odd different mice that have been linearly registered together. And then we've registered this to an atlas, which is what's overlaid on here. Um, the atlas comes from uh, the Allen Institute. And I'm gonna go into that in a little bit more detail um, in the next slide. So with this, we move the atlas space into the common anatomical space. So we can move the atlas in either direction or we can move the data to common space just showing an example where the atlas is overlaid on the anatomical data here. We can also move the EPI data into the anatomical space and a resampling of that data looks something like this. So this EPI roughly corresponds to that uh, structural image shown there. And then we can also move the atlas into the individual uh, functional space. And with this step, we can also move the calcium data either into common space or we can move the atlas into native calcium space. It really depends um, on which kind of biological question you're interested in or what kind of analysis you wanna do on these data, which of these spaces you would end up in. And we've been exploring different analyses and questions either in native calcium space, common space or individual mouse space. But again, I'm gonna highlight Bioimage Suite as a great tool for housing all these different transformations and also enabling moving the atlas back and forth. So a few more words on the atlas. Um, so for some of the analytical approaches we would like to pursue, we need a common reference space in order to do them. Um, having an anatomical prior coming from an atlas is also very useful for a starting point um, and for some questions that we're interested in looking at. Further using common space is easier to compare findings across different labs, different groups, and also taking advantage of all the data that's available from the Allen Institute. So I just wanna highlight that our strategy is not the only one by any means to go ahead and do this. Um, there's lots of people who use different ways to register to the Allen Atlas, so on and so forth, um, or created ones of their own. So there you have it. From uh, from the Allen Institute, we've uh, used a combination of what they provide as their optical reference space, as well as their histological um, reference data, both of which uh, just quick summary is shown here. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is our reference space um, based on the MRI data of about 160 animals. So by registering our data um, to a merged version of the optical and histological data, we've come to, to this point here and created several versions of the Atlas within um, 
our uh, common space. So we have a low to high resolution version, um, which accommodates both our fMRI resolution and our higher calcium imaging data. So this is just a 3D picture shown here of how to navigate through this, uh, this space. Okay, so since this is a new imaging technology, one of the first things we uh, got into was just double checking how the SNR behaved uh, both in and out of the scanner. So for here, from here on, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna refer to the calcium signal or fluorescence signal interchangeably. And for these experiments, we use the GCAMP indicator, um, which measures calcium fluorescence from excitatory neurons only. Um, we'll get into some other cell types and other contrasts uh, later on. So using our simultaneous optical and MR imaging setup, we trialed two um, different surgical preparations. First, an acute as well as a chronic surgical preparation. Um, while working on these, we investigated the optical signal to noise um, that we and compared what we can get both inside the scanner as well as what we can get outside of the scanner. So these uh, scatter plots, which should appear, there we go, okay. Um, so both wavelengths that we acquire during these optical experiments. So in these experiments, we acquire both a cyan wavelength, which is GCAMP sensitive, as well as a UV or violet wavelength, which is a baseline measurement. So those are shown in both cyan and, and purple in these scatter plots, and the colored dots correspond to individual animals. Um, and the same animals are used um, in all in uh, either the acute or the chronic experiment. So the yellow, orange, and red dots correspond to three imaging time points in the same mice. So the data from left to right uh, in each of these plots are for different scan times uh, or different runs within the scan session. So we were looking for effects of uh, SNR changes over time during scan time because their photo bleaching was a bit of a concern um, and definitely seemed to manifest later on. Um, as well as looking at differences uh, across time. So during the chronic preparation, um, the surgery is performed about a week before the first imaging session. Um, in this preparation, we use skull thinning to improve some of the optical signal transmission. Um, and then we image at seven, 14, or 21 days after surgery, shown here. And then these same mice were recovered afterwards and we used equipment outside of the scanner to check um, how our in-scanner approach uh, compared to an out-of-scanner approach. And during this imaging session, we included both an awake uh, data acquisition as well as an acquisition under isofluorine. So isofluorine is what we use in the scanner up until now. Um, so we wanted to compare just if there was any changes in SNR associated with that. Um, so overall, the take home here is that the experiments performed inside the scanner uh, were pretty good in terms of SNR compared to the commercially available equipment we use outside the scanner. We were also encouraged by the decreased amount of variance that we saw, especially by the uh, third week after surgery uh, in scanner. So I'm gonna go through a few of the uh, ways that we can use these data or that we've been uh, looking at how we can uh, compare these uh, different signals. And I'm gonna start with just using um, the Allen Atlas imposed onto the cortical tissue, um, comparing the uh, calcium signal to the bold signal um, from these simultaneous measurements. So I'm gonna start with uh, evoked responses. So with the multimodal data um, in the common space, we can examine the relationship between these two signals as synchronized by, by a stimulus. So in here we use a hind paw stimulation. So an example uh, time course from this highlighted region here, so this is a sensory area since we're using hind paw stimulation, um, you can see the calcium signal in green and the bullet signal in orange. So note that these data were averaged within the responding ROI, but not averaged in time. So there's three presentations of the stimulus as indicated by black lines um, beneath the signal traces. And you'll notice that a large calcium response appears to elicit a similarly large bold response. Likewise, small responses also co-occur across the two modalities. So these are, I'll emphasize in response to the same exact presentation of the stimuli. So we're not varying amplitude, strength, um, or the frequency of the stimulation. 
And we find that across uh, different mice, um, the calcium and bold responses appear to be correlated in terms of their normalized amplitude. So this indicates that the spontaneous fluctuations in response, am in response amplitudes between modalities in response to identical stimuli show some con cross contrast relationship. So from this, we conclude that these fluctuations in amplitude are not caused by noise, which would be typically averaged out in an experiment that did not collect these data simultaneously. But in fact, they're evidence of real moment to moment vari variations in the brain's response. So this gives us some confidence both in our simultaneous measurement as well as the correspondence between these different contrasts. So next we wanted to uh, look for a relationship um, in spontaneous activity. So we're going to do away that with this uh, uh, stimulation. So for this analysis, we were inspired by a paper uh, published um, a little while ago now in PNAS by Dr. Hillman's group. Um, where they used a gamma variate fitting approach to correlate calcium with hemodynamic activity, which they've measured optically. So we're going to use the same analytical approach. Um, however, instead of using optical measurements, we're going to apply it to our simultaneous multimodal calcium um, and bold fMRI data. So the gamma variate fitting approach uh, estimates an amplitude, time, and width of a gamma function, which serves as a hemodynamic response function to translate the calcium to the bold signal. So in this example, the average calcium is plotted again in green, bold in orange, and the transformed calcium signal uh, is plotted in blue. So you, and the, uh, I'm just noting the Pearson correlation for before um, and after uh, this transformation um, on the plot. And for a second example, this shows an epoch of about 50 seconds of activity for a primary visual area. And from this analysis, we also gain this transfer function um, as shown here, where we have an estimated amplitude, time of peak, as well as uh, width of peak. And this is just six different animals um, using just spontaneous activity measurements um, from a number of different scan sessions. So we can also capture the correspondence between the bold and calcium signals across different cortical regions. Besides these two examples here, we can extrapolate to 18 different um, cortical regions taken from the Allen Atlas and compared to shuffled data, we see reasonable correspondence um, for these excitatory neurons. So overall, um, these data show about a third of the variance in the bold signal to be predicted from the calcium signal. And the last thing that I'm showing here is just the distribution of those parameters that I mentioned before, the amplitude, time, and width of peak um, as they distribute across the different Allen Atlas regions. And what you're, what's the sort of take home here from these maps is, is that there doesn't seem to be a very clear spatial pattern. There's definitely some variance, um, but it's in agreement with what Hillman actually observed um, in her data was that the, uh, the correspondence between the signals, the hemodynamic and calcium signal measured optically in her hands um, didn't show a strong uh, pattern or bias across the cortex. So in addition to using the Allen Atlas, um, which relies on ROIs defined by cytology or other, diff other, other methods, we can use um, methods of our own based on function, such as k-means clustering to define different functional regions using either the calcium or bold data. So this approach and others like it, group voxels um, or pixels based on common features um, within their time courses. Uh, so a similarity metric essentially. So there's results in what we call a parcelation or a group of different parcels. And these regions reflect different underlying physical organization of brain function. So we generate parcelations using data from each one hemisphere at a time so that we can compare um, the bilateral symmetry um, by flipping across the midline. So doing it first in the right hemisphere, left hemisphere. And since these animals are healthy, we expect them to show good bilateral symmetry or a recapitulation of this organization in the two hemispheres. So we can implement this approach using either the calcium data or the bold data. So what I'm plotting here is the uh, bilateral correspondence. And again, there's our bold data, so we would use that in order to do our own uh, parcellation there and compare the bilateral symmetry. Um, within the bold signal. 
We can also compare across uh, modalities, which is the final thing that I'm showing here where we have the calcium-based parcellation as well as the fMRI-based functional parcellation overlaying the two. And we get a comparison of the physical organization um, of that structure. Is that, a, is that a question that's coming in? Sorry, I saw a notification. Yes, we will awesome. let our speaker ask in a second. You can continue for a few minutes. Okay. okay. So this is the, uh, the overlap of these two functional parcellations, one based on each contrast, just for six different mice. And it shows definitely above average um, or above random correspondence between these organizational metrics. However, there are still some notable differences. It's not perfect overlap. And uh, teasing into some of these uh, organizational differences is something that we're, we're interested in pursuing. Okay, so from either the Island Atlas or from a data-driven parcellation, we can measure functional connectivity. So here we define functional connectivity as the correlation strength between pairs of ROIs. So these data um, are summarized using a matrix where columns and rows correspond to different parcels um, within the atlas or the parcellation. And the strength of the correlation is represented by the color scale, hot and cold color scale shown here. So this example shows average connectivity strength for the whole brain um, based on fMRI data using the Allen Atlas. So an encouraging feature that I'll just point out on this matrix um, is the diagonal that appears in the upper right um, and left uh, and lower left quadrants. Um, so these entries correspond to bilaterally paired regions where you would anticipate there to be higher synchrony. So the dotted line indicates that, uh, that match. And just uh, the cartoon at the bottom here, which seems to be going now, there we go, um, just outlines how we do this measurement. So just Pearson's correlation between uh, one region and all of its pairs would correspond to a row in the matrix. So for this, we find that both within and between hemispheres, calcium and bold connectivity shows a relationship. So in other words, on average, regions that are more synchronous or are functionally collect connected, um, according to the calcium data, also show a similar relationship um, within the bold data. So although there is a clear relationship across the whole brain overall, um, we also wanted to look for regional differences. So these last two plots here show connectivity strength within um, as well as between hemispheres for two regions that are highlighted in yellow. So on the one side, on the left, we have the uh, somatosensory cortex, um, and on the right, we have the secondary motor cortex. For the somatosensory cortex, we observe a positive correlation between modalities within hemisphere, but interhemispherically, we show the opposite. So there's an anti correlation. This hints at a deviation in these contrasts in terms of network and, and uh, circuit level structure. So notably, these data in calcium are measuring excitatory neurons only. So we think this difference could be a reflection of interhemispheric inhibition. So asynchronous excitatory activity could correspond to synchronous inhibition, which may be being reflected in this bold connectivity strength. That said, it's just a hypothesis for this point in time. Um, we definitely need to interrogate different kinds of measurements such as calcium specific inhibitory measurements um, in order to start teasing this apart uh, more thoroughly. And I'll come back to that um, in, a, in a later slide. So as I hinted on the previous slide, we're interested in these functional connectivity measures that we can also use for calcium and bold to look at network and circuit level analyses. And this is just an illustration of what that might look like um, so this can be implemented in healthy animals. It can also be used to compare uh, different experimental groups. So this is another tool in BioInch Suite. It's a connectivity viewer. And overlaid on this uh, brain is shown uh, in common space, two networks, one with uh, positive connectivity, one with negative connectivity. So synchronous or asynchronous, uh, which summarizes these differences in a way that we can compare across um, say a mouse with a knockout uh, gene, which is what's shown here versus uh, one without. So using this approach, we can dig a little deeper into functional connectivity-based measurements associated with different uh, phenotypes. 
So that concludes sort of the uh, the pilot work that we've done um, and some of the tools that we can use um, with this uh, simultaneous measurement. And I wanted to now get into some of our, our latest um, stuff. So I'm going to start by going through the latest set of uh, data that we've acquired. Um, now I'll emphasize that this is pretty preliminary stuff, but I'm still excited to share with the with this audience what we've been working on. So for these experiments, we included um, five groups of mice each with a different genetically encoded fluorescence indicator, one for glia, one for interneurons, um, probalmin interneurons that I'm gonna to refer to as PV, the same excitatory neural marker that we used in our first study here and also called SLC, just because of the uh, genomic marker, um, an inhibitory neuron marker called SOM, as well as a second uh, interneuron marker or VIP. So each group is comprised of about 10 animals and all of them underwent the same head implant procedure at about two months of age. Um, following that and the recovery time, they were imaged uh, three times using the multimodal setup. And during each multimodal imaging session, following induction with isofluorine, as before, um, we collect both resting state fMRI data, uh, or measures of spontaneous activity, in 10 minute blocks, as well as a pre uh, a, we present a unilateral this time. Uh, LED stimulation. Um, so also in uh, 10 minute blocks where we have a uh, very brief five second stimulus uh, every minute, so fairly sparse. And interleaved with these uh, functional MRI imaging sessions, we have uh, the acquisition of a bunch of anatomical data, um, which we use for our multimodal registration. So either moving the calcium data to individual space uh, where the fMRI data resides using the same angiogram um, approach as we did before, and then the same common space uh, where we have the Allen Atlas, if that's what we want to use. So I'll say one more time, we're in the throes of analyzing these data, but I can share some of the earliest results. Um, so first, um, the good news is that we can image these different fluorophores. Um, and different labels. There is some concern that this might be a challenge just because compared to excitatory neurons that we started with, the sparseness of these other cell type populations um, is fairly low. So here on, I'm gonna focus on two cell type groups, um, mice labeled with the glia cell marker and the mice labeled with the SLC or excitatory neural marker. So let's have a look at some of these movies. So this is uh, on the top row here, um, you see three different mice from the glia group. So these are recordings done in scanner with simultaneous fMRI data being recorded. Um, each movie is looping through about a minute of data. Um, note that these data have been sped up about two and a quarter times. So you're seeing just under four minutes of data over the course of a minute here. And in the second row um, are three more animals, these from the SLC group. So it's really tempting to try and look at patterns um, between the movies, between the top two rows, but I'll emphasize these are different epochs of spontaneous activity acquired across six different animals from two gr different groups. But the take home message is that we can reliably record the spontaneous activity in scanner um, from different cell types. And these data are all from uh, the third imaging session actually. So this is more than a about a month after the surgery. So that was encouraging for us as well. So using these data, we've begun um, a few preliminary analyses. Um, first, uh, data-driven parcellations. So examining the functional organization of these uh, different cell types across the brain. So these functional parcellations are based on the calcium imaging data collected in the scanner. Again, using the same scheme as before, where we have the parcellation first done in the left hemisphere and then the right hemisphere and overlaid on top of the colored regions which correspond to the results of these, this functional parcellation are the Allen Atlas uh, ROIs for reference. So this parcellation was generated um, in the same way as our previous work, but you'll notice that there are more regions than we included before. So this comes from having just a lot more data um, and also the gains that we've gotten from uh, the skull thinning that we've started to implement. And just for uh, reference, we also have the SLC functional parcellation shown here. Um, so at this point, we're still examining um, a lot of the correspondence between the functional, the physical organization of these functional regions between different cell types, between different mice, how reproducible it is across sessions. 
Um, so there's a lot of different uh, things we can tease into here and we're only just uh, really getting started. So one thing we can do here uh, is that we can take a peek also at the spontaneous activity within different regions. So here we're going to focus on the Allen Atlas regions um, as before. So imposing the uh, atlas onto the calcium activity as well as doing a back projection to look at the same corresponding regions within the fMRI data. So for this comparison, we're trying to match the physical tissue as best we can by back projecting because we've got a two-dimensional integration essentially in depth within our calcium imaging space. So we want the corresponding bold activity. So for a random region and a random mouse and a random 50 seconds of data, um, I'm plotting the calcium time course um, averaged within an ROI for a glia mouse in green and the corresponding bold signal uh, in orange. So they are notably well correlated. The R squared value is just noted there. And for a second glia mouse, we observe something similar. So we can compare this um, to another mouse from the SLC group. So that's two glia on top and one uh, excitatory neuron from the bottom or excitatory neuron mouse on the bottom. So as we did before, we can use these data to extrapolate a cell type specific transfer function. So shown in purple is the glia data derived transfer function and across uh, taken from across five different mice and the SLC or excitatory neuron transfer function average across six mice. So we can compare the estimated amplitude, time of peak and full width of path maximum if we want. Um, although these are very preliminary findings, um, they have us excited. This is still, um, there's still a lot that needs to be done to tease out um, of these data. So for instance, um, there are also epochs that look like this in other regions. So this relationship looks very different than the other two. They're negatively correlated. So I've highlighted these first panels for one reason and this last panel for, uh, for another reason. So there seems to be some, some areas and times that are correlated with what we would uh, predict, no pun intended, and others that are quite the opposite. So, um, Basically the physical location, the frequency of activity at a certain time, or what kind of activity preceded it or followed it may be influencing uh, what's going on here. But we basically have our, our work cut out for us in terms of sorting through what all these different uh, regions are doing at different times, but we're working on it. <laughs> so, um, all this is very exciting um, and all of this we've implemented thus far in healthy animals. However, um, our group is very interested in looking at um, how these measurements change in different disease models. So the mouse offers a lot of flexibility to both introduce a wide array of fluorescence markers, which we're taking advantage of, as well as to interrogate different types of disease processes using mutants. So, however, these are physically fairly challenging things to combine, combine into the same animal. So you can't have too many genetic manipulations without bumping into some problems. So in the introduction, I mentioned that we can use either genetically encoded indicators or virally mediated fluorescence markers. Um, and until now, we've been implementing these uh, genetically encoded fluorescence markers. But now I'll introduce you to a new approach um, that allows us to introduce uniform whole, bra whole brain fluorescence um, using just viruses. So typically viruses um, to introduce fluorescence are injected um, locally into a region of interest. But for us, since we wanna do mesoscopic imaging, we need a lot of coverage, um, which isn't easy to gain using an injection method um, and why we've been using genetic markers up until this point. However, a colleague of ours recently published uh, this paper, which is fantastic for us, uh, that shows that if at P01 or, or within the first 24 hours after birth, um, the blood brain barrier is underdeveloped enough in the mouse pup that a small minimally invasive injection, which you can do through the skull into the transverse sinuses is, is possible. And this distributes the virus evenly throughout the cortex resulting in beautiful uniform whole brain expression very early in development. So it's an extremely versatile approach. Um, and we've been working with a few um, exciting implementations. First, introducing an option which can excite 
which we can excite using light. So we can uh, drive cell type specific activity using uh, light, showing here the first uh, histology images of this approach, um, as well as introducing fluorescence into different disease models. So that's what I'm going to get into here. And the final way we're applying this is also um, introducing more than one fluorophore at once. So we can look at, say, simultaneous glia as well as excitatory activity. So specifically um, in this project, um, we're using a transgenic model of Alzheimer's disease. So this is already a fairly complex uh, genetic manipulation. So that's why we opted for trying this uh, virally mediated fluorescence um, injection. So here we're using a virus for panneuronal GCAMP expression into the double knock-in as well as the wild type litter mate controls. And at about two months of age, they undergo um, our head implant protocol with skull thinning. And then at three months of age, we begin longitudinal uh, multimodal imaging. So I'm just showing uh, the first minimally pre-processed data here, but we were very encouraged to see that it was successful in inducing uh, fluorescence. So we can look at either the movie or a couple frames that I'm just um, teasing out from that movie here, but we have sufficient signal from this approach to uh, do this kind of imaging in a uh, double knock-in mouse model. Okay, and with that, I'd like to thank uh, the collaborators that I've been lucky enough to, uh, to have and uh, highlighting a few people here in radiology, uh, my previous supervisor and mentor, Todd Constable, as well as stellar postdoc who's done a lot of the work that I'm showing here, Francesca, um, and some key folks in neuroscience, notably Dr. Mike Crare, um, as well as Ali, who uh, headed up the uh, transverse sinus injection method, um, and our collaborators, especially uh, Dr. Stripmatter for the Alzheimer's disease mouse model. Um, also, all of you for your attention. Um, and I guess I'm going to stop sharing now so that we can go to any questions anybody might have. All right, thank you very much, Evelyn, uh, for the nice talk. So uh, we have a first question from Suzanne. Um, so Suzanne, you can unmute yourself and ask your, the question if you want. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and, thank, and sorry for sending it early in the talk and interrupting you. Oh, no, I got so excited that you were going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was really beautiful. Thank you so much for, for showing all this data. Um, I was wondering, um, because you mentioned you had been using isoflurane uh, up until recently. Is there, I'm um, just curious to hear if you changed uh, anesthetics and whether your MRI setup allows for awake imaging as well. We're working on awake. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> We're just starting that. So it's uh, everything we've designed thus far is compatible with awake imaging. So the surgery, the uh, holder, everything else. Um, and the fact that the uh, surgery is good longitudinally but uh, we're just getting into exactly what we need for training and for all that fun stuff. So, but it's, it's undeniable that that's the direction we have to go, um, especially with the optical data being such a component of what we're doing. And so much of that is done in the awake condition as is. So I can go on all day about awake versus anesthetized, but yes. Yeah. Is the answer. Well, thank you. That's very exciting. Thanks. Um, we have another question from Sava, so you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Hey, Evelyn. Hey, how you doing? Doing good. It's a great talk. Thanks. Thanks. I love your background. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so just a very practical question. Uh, when you are looking in the optical signals and then you are fixing the, the calcium signal by uh, accounting for the hemodynamics, looking at another wavelength. Now you use many other models, right? Where you introduce calcium signal in, in interneurons in glial cells. So across all these different uh, models that you're using, uh, how amplitude, raw amplitudes of oscillations of these two signals, one when you have calcium and hemodynamics and the other where you have hopefully only hemodynamics, how they compare across these different models? Yeah, so good question. So that's something that uh, we're, we're working on exactly how we should treat that because it's, it's not totally obvious. And for the excitatory neurons, it's, it's very different amplitude. So you have a big difference between your cyan wavelength and your violet wavelength. It's, it's quite far apart when you plot them. 
But as you get to say the interneurons, which are our dimmest option, it starts to really, the gap closes significantly. So that is not entirely obvious how to solve. Um, and we're also investigating other methods of measuring say oxy deoxyhemoglobin with using a triple wavelength approach, which might be more appropriate, um, especially in this context. So I, I, you're, you're more of an expert on this than I am. And I think I, I would also be keen to hear of what you think the best approaches would be um, and how to tease those apart. So we're, we're all ears on that front and we're definitely cognizant that it's not an unsolved and not I, entirely I obvious. In the hemoglobin, right? With the partial path length and stuff. I think this yep. is a little bit more accurate may give you more sensitivity though. I mean, I, I'm a bit uh, worried when you said in some of them, especially interneurons, which are so interesting, right? You have big change in big difference in amplitude. Th this could be a bit tricky one to accurately uh, recover. Definitely, we're, we're in full agreement on that. Thanks. Okay, um, there's another question from Patricia. Thank you very much. It was a really wonderful talk. I was interested in the glial response with bold, and you mentioned that that could have been under anesthesia. And I was wondering what type of anesthesia did you use? And did you see any change in the correlation between glial and the bold response with different anesthetics or different levels of isoflurane? So all the data that I've shown here and that we've been looking at in detail is all collected under a very low isoflurane condition. So we haven't extrapolated that out to looking at the awake um, explicitly yet um, or investigated other uh, anesthetic methods. That being said, we do use a level of anesthesia that's about between 0.5 and 0.7% ISO. So it's more of a quiescent anesthetized state than a fully deep anesthetized state. So as I, as I said to, the first, to Suzanne, I, I believe was the first question, um, is that we, we fully appreciate that this needs to be investigated further using getting rid of that confound, unfortunately introducing stress at the same time. Um, but it's something that we're looking at. And we are comparing some of the measurements, at least on the calcium side that we get, in the scanner to data that we can collect out of the scanner without MRI in that, in that context. Um, but at least we can do that easily in the awake on the typical optical setup. Mm, thank you for that. Very much. Yeah. Cool. Oh, no, I just wanted to ask, do you induce the animal first with 5% isoflurane before going into a very light or do you immediately start we, with- We start with 3%. We never go higher than 3%. They go into the scanner and then they have at least 45 minutes to an hour at the lower isoflurane before we start considering the fMRI data. So that's really great. Thank you so much for that. Of course. Thanks for the question. Um, Brandy, you have another question? You can ask a question. Sure. That, that was an absolutely brilliant presentation. I loved every bit of it. And it was an incredible amount of work to do what you do. So just kudos to start with. Uh, my question may be, a limitation of my understanding of one of the things that you described, but um, when you're looking for um, making the correlation between the fMRI data and the calcium imaging data, um, you t it, it sounded to me like you were really focusing on just using the fMRI data from those voxels, from that slice that corresponded to the slice of the calcium imaging data. And I couldn't tell, like you mentioned something at the end about looking at the connect, the functional connectivity. I, but what I was wondering is and if that you had already showed it to me, but I couldn't follow you quite exactly the way you were, because um, you covered so much amazing material. But the idea that I want, I'm wondering about is if you use all of the fMRI data and you do functional connectivity mapping in and look at networks in the fMRI, and then you look for correspondences and say nodes or you know, regions of, uh, of those networks that overlap in that one plane that you have of the calcium imaging data. Can you use that information to clean up? So you were, you were able to show a pretty nice correlation, but do you get it even nicer, even cleaner if you use more of the fMRI data to understand what you're seeing in that one slice? 
Do you so understand what I'm asking? I, I do. And it's like, I, at the beginning, I start out harping on like, we get the whole brain and then we get the, the cortex, but we haven't, we have the whole brain. We haven't been using it to its full potential yet. So that's the, that's the short answer, but uh, we've been focusing really to get a, get a sense on how best to do both the pre-processing of these data yeah. and also a sense of how, how well they agree and where they, when they don't agree and when they do yeah. agree by focusing on what, we, what we're calling in the lab, these anatomically matched physical yeah. locations. So yes, we've been limiting ourselves basically to the bold signal within the cortex for now, but it is definitely one of our goals to tease into the deeper sub sub uh, subcortical regions and see if how that activity corresponds to what's happening in the cortex and if you can actually use that to either predict or um, tease out some of what you don't see or, or don't have uh, in the calcium regions lower down yeah. also um, we're with the uh, transverse sinus injection method that i that i mentioned we can introduce a fluorophore that we can excite so that we can do in deeper tissues as well so we can introduce um, optogenetics at that point and say drive a subcortical region optically cell type specific and see how that activity manifests cortically yeah um, all, all good those are all great ideas I, I i think the the there there may be some interesting work from humans where they're looking at like uh, lesion connectivity mapping and things like that there's some methods that may be developed you know on the human side that may be uh, useful to consider how to work with them backwards and on, on a completely separate but also related this work is so cool there's so many cool things to do um, have you thought about not that your experiments aren't unbelievably complex and require eight million different things to be coordinated to come off so beautifully um, have you thought about using pharmacological manipulations to answer some of your questions like using GABA agonists or glutamate terms you know to, to try and disin disentangle some of what you're looking at? Absolutely. Uh, you're not the first person to mention that. It's, a, it's on our to-do list for sure yeah. um, of something that would be very interesting to look at. So even coordinated release of certain uh, chemicals by using optics are, is an option that's sort of emerging um, and uh, even more crude ways of introducing this as well. So it's, it's something that's definitely uh, in our wheelhouse to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So great. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing. No, thank you. Thank you for the questions very much. Uh, all right. We have one last question. Um, Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hi. Can you hear me? It's very nice work. Amazing. So uh, I, I, I like this astro site, you know, clearly. <laughs> yes. Particularly, you show this negative correlation feature. I'm very, I, I, want, I, want, I want to know more. So this is under any under isofluorine, right? You talk about a, it's a light anesthesia. So, yes. so how often you, you see this negative correlation versus um so I I have to confess that I, I only got that far with the data this past weekend. So I oh. can't give you a, <laughs> I can't give you a solid a solid answer on that, but it's not infrequent. Um, that's I for see. sure. I see. So there's definitely enough of it based on the, the one histogram I've looked at um, yeah. that it's something we can definitely tease into. It's not an anomaly yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in the data set that we have right now. Um, yeah. so, so in, in terms of quantifying it, though, we're far away from being able to make any, yeah. any solid claims. That could be something very interesting. I just want to share some experience. I think I saw Florent from our work we we sell them because you know you may know our work you know published you know from the, I remember you're talking also, to, uh, at the talk about astrocyte, right particularly for astrocytic signal so what they are showing here we definitely observe it so the negative correlation is not like something artifacts for my view it's like something even more exciting from the neurovascular coupling perspective and I saw fluorine the observation is much lower that's pretty much what you mentioned about it if it, you are if you are able to switch to different anesthetics. So there may be something even more exciting, particularly I know from the alpha chloridus or urosin. So, um, so you're working on mice, alpha chloridus uh, may be hard, but the urosin may be feasible. So if you can try it, maybe you'll see much more exciting stuff because you are seeing the whole brain. Right? 
is, is good. It's good stuff. Yeah, I, I'm very excited to go in that direction. Um, absolutely. And I was I was on the edge of my seat when I was listening to your your talk at uh, Anna's neurophotonics meeting as well. Yeah. So it's the, there's a reason why I picked the glia as the first ones to go and have a look at that data yeah. as well. Very, very, so, very nice to see that. It's, it's great work conversation. Yeah. Thank it'll, you. It'll be fun. Yeah. All right, um, so thank you. Thank you for the elegant talk, Evelyn, and thank you everyone uh, for the nice discussion. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you and uh, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Bye everyone, stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.